Welcome to a webinar on guidance to promote family rules and workplace policies to reduce cell phone use while driving and promote engaged driving. My name is Jay Otto, and I'm a researcher with the Center for Health and Safety Culture, and I'll be leading the webinar today. However, I do uh, want to recognize and acknowledge the work of other members at the center, Carrie Finley, Anne-Marie Mayhill, and Jamie Arpin, as, well, as really all the members of the center contributed to this project. Um, so I just want to acknowledge everybody who worked on the project. Before we get uh, started, we want to acknowledge the sponsor for this project was the Traffic Safety Culture Transportation Pooled Fund. Uh, this is managed by the Mo Montana Department of Transportation, Sue Sillick, um, and it has a number of participating states which are listed there. If you are, you know, a member of an organization that works on transportation or transportation safety, or you are uh, uh, em employed by a state DOT or another locality, any kind of organization can really participate in the pooled fund. So if you're at all interested in that, uh, please reach out to Sue. Her email address is right there, and she can provide more information about ways that you could potentially participate in future research that's funded by this transportation pooled fund. Just quickly, a little bit about our technology. I think we've all gotten more comfortable with this during the pandemic. Uh, if you're not familiar with webinar, uh, WebEx, if you have any trouble with your audio, you can click on the three dots at the bottom. That will give you an opportunity to connect or reconnect to audio. You can connect to audio with uh, voice over internet, or you can have uh, you can call in with your phone, or you could have the system call you. So you have a number of options. There is also a chat window that you can use to share um, and respond to any questions or um, ask questions yourself. There's also a question and answer uh, panel that you can also use to send in questions. And I'll try to keep my eye on that throughout the webinar. I might answer it in the moment, or I might wait till the end of the webinar and address the questions then. We'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So just a little bit about uh, background about the center. We are the, the Center for Health and Safety Culture. We're an interdisciplinary group. We have a, a, uh, individuals with a wide variety of backgrounds. And our research is really to explore um, how shared values and beliefs influence people's behaviors, in particular, behaviors that influence health and safety. So um, all of our research is applied. We work with sponsors who are seeking to move the needle on, on real issues and real communities. Um, we also think it's extremely important to bring what we learn out to communities. So we um, do a lot of training and we also do guidance in our projects. So these are ways that we can bring um, the information out to uh, the people doing the work and hopefully increase that technology transfer. At the center, we primarily work on four major issues, uh, traffic safety, preventing the misuse of substances. We do some work around domestic violence or interpersonal violence, as well as child well-being and child maltreatment. And of course, you know that these issues are interrelated. You know, about a third of all fatal uh, crashes, uh, vehicle crashes involve the misuse of substances, impaired driving. We know that uh, misuse of substances can uh, make violence worse. Um, we also know that um, child maltreatment or adverse experiences uh, of children called ACEs um, can increase the likelihood that perhaps they may misuse substances later in life. So really these issues are very interconnected, but it's also interesting just to note how um, federal agencies and state agencies and local agencies may or may not uh, connect the dots between them. And um, we like in our research to look in these four different areas and just look for the, 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 the intersection and the way that these overlap, as well as look at the intersection about how we might try to address these. And is there an overarching approach that would allow us to address multiple issues um, uh, at, the, at the community, state, or federal level? So quick question just to get us going. Does your organization have a clear policy about distracted driving? And is that policy enforced? So just take a moment and uh, put your responses in the chat box 
so we can see uh, what you think. It's interesting, you know, we, we all work for a variety of different kinds of organizations. So it's, it's valuable to bring this idea of traffic safety and traffic safety culture right into the context of where we work. So as I can see from some of your responses, some of you say, yes, we absolutely have a clear policy, but maybe no, maybe it's not always enforced. So this is uh, an idea which we're gonna explore throughout um, this entire webinar and was really one of the major thrusts of this project. So the challenge, as you well may know, is that distraction is a significant factor in crashes and it's, it's one that we might not really well understand because if we just look at crash reports, it can be very difficult, right? If it's a, if uh, the individual may not um, may not uh, admit that they were, let's say, using a cell phone prior to a crash, uh, investigating officer may try to figure that out or may not. Um, obviously, if it's a single vehicle fatal crash, we may not know what the driver was doing just prior to the crash. One of the, the research projects that has led a lot of uh, greater insights about this is the naturalistic study where they were able to put video cameras as well as other sensing devices in vehicles for quite some time. So the video cameras looked forward to see what the driver was seeing, but they also looked at the driver in the cab of the vehicle. And they were left there for long enough so that people sort of got used to them. Um, and that was a really valuable way to just watch and see what people were doing while, while they were driving and what may have, they have been doing preceding any kind of crash or near crash. And what they found was that uh, distraction was, was uh, a factor in the majority of crashes, so it's almost seven out of 10. So it's definitely something we wanna be aware of. And as of course we know that the use of cell phones can significantly increase the odds of being in a crash. So the purpose of this project was to design tools and strategies that address distracted driving and really foster conversations. Conversations in two important contexts. One was the family context. So in other words, what kind of conversations could we improve between parents and a teen driver, as well as the workplace context. And this was between a supervisor and individuals who drive for work. And the goal of that conversation may be to establish or clarify existing expectations. Those could be rules, those could be policies, but we wanna make those expectations very clear and well understood about distracted driving. And we recognize, and as we'll see and when we look at some of the data, we really think it is gonna be about conversations, that just having a policy or a rule may not be enough, that it's really gonna be the conversations triggered by that policy or rule. We also wanna expand the idea of, of just avoiding distracted driving and really think about promoting engaged driving. This is uh, uh, some language that um, the Idaho uh, Department of Transportation, Idaho Transportation Department has, has sought to use and really um, they, they've even branded it around the notion of shift, to shift the conversation from just not, not to focus on what we're not supposed to do, but focus on what we're supposed to do. And as we'll see, distracted driving can involve multiple behaviors. So really the conversation needs to be about how am I staying as engaged, fully engaged as the driver in the driving task. All right, so we're gonna explore a little bit about some distracting behaviors. We're gonna look at some common elements of interventions or conversations. I mean, if, if we're gonna be intentional with a conversation, what elements might we want that conversation or conversations to have to be effective? Then uh, we're gonna talk about what we learned from doing some surveys with parents and supervisors and what we learned from testing some messages and then bring it all together in some resources and have some chance at the end to, to answer some questions. So this is uh, the results from that from the naturalistic driving study, some of the results, there are lots of results, but this was particularly focusing on distracting behaviors. And of course, we, we're pretty, we pretty much know, right? If you're using a handheld cell phone, in particular, you're trying to dial or text or even talk on it, that can be very high risk for crash. 
anytime we're reading, we're taking our eyes off the road. This is very dangerous. So reading or writing on a, on even a tablet or anything else. But it's interesting, some other ones that, that are important are things like reaching for an object. And that's not, not reaching for the cell phone, but just reaching for any object in the vehicle was recognized as high risk and, and also occurring with some degree of prevalence. Even an extended glance to something outside of the vehicle, not, not just looking inside the vehicle, but looking outside the vehicle was high risk. So this is where I think we really need to expand our notion of distracted driving and not let it just be about cell phones. Um, because there are many other things which are distracting drivers, which, which happen with some degree of prevalence and very high risk. And so we need to expand that notion in that conversation. You can also see other things like just adjusting in the device in the vehicle or eating, drinking, you know, non-alcoholic, just drinking coffee or whatever, uh, personal hygiene and, and even dancing in the seat. So all of these are potentially risky things and we, we need to expand that notion of distraction from beyond just cell phone to the multiple multitude of behaviors that, that can distract the driver. So now let's shift a little bit and talk about what might be common elements of interventions or conversations to make them effective at changing behavior. Well, one element that was recognized is cognitive engagement. If the individual is not engaged in our quote unquote conversation, it's not going to be very effective. And, you know, if, if you've been a parent, you, you've certainly had those conversations, maybe that really weren't conversations. You were saying things and your child was saying, yeah, sure, uh-huh. And at the end of the conversation, you maybe asked your child, well, what did we just talk about? They're like, I have no idea. I was just saying yes. So we can't just assume because we are saying something that others are hearing it or are even engaged. So the first piece we have to do is just get them engaged and really thinking about what we're going to talk about. We will definitely need to build some knowledge and skills. We're going to have to learn about doing things in different ways. In the workplace, this could be, you know, talking about what our policy is and then how will we work if we have such a policy where we're not to be using the cell phone while driving? You know, what, what will our work processes be? We need to practice. We need to actually try it on. And as supervisors or parents, we need to make the assumption that it's not just going to be one conversation. This is something we're going to have to talk about multiple times, and it's going to take quite a while for people to shift their behavior. And of course, in the workplace, we always have turnover. So we're going to have to have these conversations from anew when, when we have a new employee arrive. We're going to have to provide ongoing support. So while people practice, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to, they're going to forget. They're going to do things that they shouldn't have done. And we need to come back and sort of coach and reteach and address those and remind folks of, of what our expectations are and how we can uh, operate and behave. And then finally, we're going to need to support. We're going to need to, um, excuse me. Finally, we're going to need some motivation. We're going to need to uh, motivate folks to continue to try, to continue to work at it, um, to continue to improve. And um, this is something that we found in the surveys people reported doing, but often we find there's even more opportunities. Sometimes we feel like, you know, if things are going well, we don't need to really say anything. It's, we, we tend to speak up when things aren't going well, but really we need to speak up when things are going well. Um, because that can really bolster motivation to sustain positive improvement as well as address future improvement. Really, this is largely about fostering an internal locus of control. How are we getting folks to really um, internally commit to better behaviors, right? If we pass a rule, a family rule, or we have a workplace policy, we can really sort of force people to, or try to force people to comply with it. But compliance can be really an external locus of control. If, if nobody's watching, I'm just going to do it anyway, right? But what we really want is a commitment. We want an internal locus of control where people are choosing to be healthier and safer. Uh, and so all of these five steps are really about bolstering an internal locus of control. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we did this. So we use surveys 
to try to understand what parents, parents of teenagers who are driving, as well as supervisors, um, supervisors of workers who drive for work, what they were thinking. So we wanted to understand their behaviors and beliefs associated just with distracted driving, right? I mean, if a parent doesn't think distracted driving is, is an issue or they don't think, um, you know, uh, using a cell phone while driving is distracting, then it's less likely that they're going to talk to their child about it, right? So we need to just see what their basic thoughts are and their own behaviors are around distracted driving. And then we also wanted to understand their beliefs and behaviors associated with preventing others. So what are they doing about sort of teaching about the dangers of distracted driving? What are they doing about establishing clear expectations, whether that's a family rule or a workplace policy? And what are they doing to follow up on those expectations? So we recruited participants to complete these surveys, either a parent of a young driver, so it was a driver between the ages of 16 and 18 who lived in the household, or supervisors of employees who drive for work. Um, we use Qualtrics to help recruit these. We, these were recruited all across the United States. Uh, uh, we didn't pick any particular area. And we sought a cross section. We used some quotas so that we got some differences in um, ages as well as differences in gender. Then we on, analyzed all the results that we got to sort of see how well the models uh, held up and to see what we could learn from those models. So we looked at five distracting behaviors. We looked at had a conversation on a cell phone while holding it in your hand, handheld conversation, had a conversation on a cell phone without holding it, the hands free, typed or read on a cell phone, often called texting, or even just adjusting a radio or a sound system or some sort of vehicle device, or reach for an object in the vehicle. And we asked about all these while you were driving and the vehicle was moving. So that's what we wanted to understand was these kinds of behaviors. We didn't limit it to just one general notion of distracted driving, but we really wanted to be specific. We also looked at four intervening behaviors by either a parent or a supervisor. And this included getting input. So did they, did they ask their teen or the person that they supervise, you know, some questions about distracted driving before they, they started teaching or going into what the rules were? Then did they teach? Also, what did they do to support? How did they follow up? How were, uh, did, they, did they potentially enforce policies? And did they recognize people when they were making good choices? What did they do to sort of uh, uh, bolster the person's uh, future motivation? Um, at the center, when we design surveys to understand people's behaviors, we use a, a behavioral model. And what we seek to do is measure or use multiple items to assess, you know, what are the behavioral beliefs? What are the beliefs that people have about this behavior that are lead, lead them to have a positive or negative attitude about it? What are their normative beliefs? What do they think other people are doing? And what do they think is expected of them? And what are their control beliefs? How much control do they feel like engage, they have to engage or not engage in a behavior? So we developed surveys to look at all those. And in this case, we were looking at two behaviors in each survey, right? We were looking at a risky behavior of driving distracted. And we were looking at a protective behavior of intervening or having that conversation. So we actually had two behavioral models in, um, in each survey. All right, so here's a little bit of what we learned from the parent survey. First, we just wanted to get a sense of how often were they engaging in distracted driving behaviors themselves. So we used a look back period of 30 days, thinking back over the past 30 days, how often did you engage in the following while driving and the vehicle was moving? So you can see, you know, most indicated that they rarely or never had a conversation on a cell phone while holding it in their hand. Still, 30% who were doing that, that's way too high, right? This is a very risky behavior and we just can't have that many uh, people engaging in something that has a high risk. When you look at having a conversation in a, with a, on a cell phone without holding it hands-free, much, much higher engagement in this. 
And I think people don't realize that this is still a distracting behavior because it's cognitively distracting you. You're not fully engaged in the driving task. Um, we looked at the prevalence of typing or reading on a cell phone. Again, 73% said rarely or never, but that's way too high for the percentage of people who are doing it. Again, lots of folk, folks adjusting um, in-vehicle devices, so that's potentially risky, and a large number of people who are reaching for an object, which also has very high risk. So what we could see is, yes, there are a number of people who are making healthy choices, but there are a lot of folks who are engaging in risky behaviors. So this is important to recognize because if often parents may engage in safety efforts when it involves their children, right? They, they can be off, often more protective of their children than they are of themselves. So they may be very likely to have a conversation with the youth about distracted driving. And we can see they kind of need this information too. And maybe that conversation with the youth will bolster their own beliefs and influence their own behaviors. And in that sense, sort of be a, a, a two level or a two generation approach, which can be very important when we think about strategies. So it might be sometimes difficult to engage an adult in a conversation about their own safety, but they might be more willing to engage in a conversation about their child's safety, but oh, by the way, it might influence their own safety as well. Now, we also looked at their willingness to drive distracted and how it was predicted by a variety of different beliefs. When we asked about their attitude, we shifted things up a little bit. There can be a perception amongst um, people who drive to sort of say, well, I, I'm a really good driver, so it's not risky for me to do this. So what we'd like to do is explore what is their belief or their attitudes about distracted driving. Let's imagine you were the passenger and the driver was doing it. Do you see this as safe or dangerous? So we asked whether each of those five behaviors was safe or dangerous. We looked at their perceived injunctive norms. Do they think most people who are important to them would feel it was unacceptable or acceptable for them to do these things? Their dis perceived descriptive norms. How often do they think most drivers in their community do these behaviors? And their perceived control. Do they have a sense of a choice about whether they do this? Now, of course, they do have a choice. But people may say, well, you know, I, I really don't have a choice. If, if I'm driving for work and the, and the phone rings, I have to answer it. And it's really interesting. There have been surveys of youth who will say, no, my parents have told me not to drive, you know, not to use the cell phone while I drive. But if I'm driving and my parents call me, I'm likely to answer because they've told me I'm also supposed to answer the phone if they call me. So that can put the, the youth in a really challenging situation. And that's, that's one of the reasons to have those conversations and to clarify it. But we wanted to look at their sense of control. Did they send, sense that they had a choice in doing it? And how easy or difficult would it be to avoid doing those behaviors? What we found was that all these beliefs were predictive of willingness. And so it's important to address all of these in a conversation or any kind of intervention. Now, we asked families about whether they had a family rule about engaging in these various behaviors. And you can see many of them reported, 81% reported that they had a family rule about not typing or reading on a cell phone while driving. So that's pretty good. Still, 19% saying not, so we have a lot of room to grow. But you can see some of the other behaviors, perhaps they're not talking about. So we definitely need to improve those conversations. It can't just be, hey, don't text and drive. It has to be way more than that. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity to have family rules that really focus broadly on distraction and really need to lean towards um, engaged driving, right? We need to always be 100% focused on the driving task. Now, we also ask parents about their engagement in sort of those parenting behaviors. So we asked about four parenting behaviors, right? Get input, teaching, supporting, and then uh, uh, offering motivation, recognizing. And um, you can see how they reported the prevalence of these. Overall, getting input had the lowest um, average of all the four behaviors. 
So while a number of parents reported that they, they do this, there's actually a lot of room to grow this, in particular relative to the other three behaviors. So you can see, yeah, they, they are sometimes asking about what they think of their child, what they think about distracted driving, do they think it's dangerous? What do they think in general is okay or not okay to do while driving? And you know whether and how they particularly use their so cell phone while driving. So these are important conversations that a parent could have and they could start that conversation by asking questions as opposed to just beginning with teaching or going into a lecture. This is gonna significantly increase the likelihood that the youth is really engaged and can be a way to really build the relationship between the parent and the child. We also wanted to look at how often do they engage in um, teaching behaviors. So we, we asked um, about five different examples of teaching behaviors. You know, do they talk to their child about not using a cell phone while driving? Do they talk about the dangers of distraction? Do they set clear expectations about what is acceptable and not acceptable while driving? Have they established clear rules? And do they model not driving distracted themselves? So you can see how they reported on this. There is absolutely room to grow, but in general, they, they reported a bit more teaching than they did getting input. Um, still, opportunities to be better, but there's definitely some good conversations that are going on. Now we wanted to look at support. Are they supporting their child as their child practices? So do you sort of check in with the child about whether they're using a cell phone or not while driving? So it can't be a one-time conversation. You need to follow up. Do you remind this child about your expectations? And do you follow up with appropriate consequences if this child breaks your rules? So you can see, you know, pretty good engagement on this, but again, a lot of room for improvement. And this is sometimes where parents just need a reminder. Sometimes these conversations can feel awkward or difficult. So we've learned in other projects that can be really valuable to give people language to help them be successful at this. And if you do that, they may be more likely to have these kinds of conversations because it's definitely multiple conversations. And finally, we asked, are they recognizing their child, in particular when they're making good choices? Because that's a really way to bolster motivation to grow more of the same not just having a conversation when things go poorly, but having conversations when they go well. And this can really bolster their communication and relationship so that they can have additional conversations, important conversations with their kids down the road. And you can see again, a fair number engaging in this, but, but a significant room to grow as well. All right. So when we looked at some of the things that were the beliefs that were predicting those parenting behaviors, we found that those with a positive attitude about teaching their child were more likely to do it. And we looked at six semantic differentials. That's where we asked six pairs of words. And we asked parents to rank amongst those pairs of words like good, bad, um, safe, dangerous, how they would rank this sort of conversation. We also looked at their, what we called their behavioral beliefs. And what we really looked at, did they think this was important, getting input, teaching, supporting, and recognizing if they wanted to have their child um, reduce distracted driving or not drive distracted? And overwhelmingly, parents did think it was important, but how they answered this question was predictive of whether they engaged in parenting behaviors. We also looked at their perceived descriptive norms. Did they think other parents were engaging in these four steps. And what was the quality of their, as they reported, the relationship and communication with their teen? And that was predictive of whether they were having the conversations. If they had thought they had a poor relationship or poor communication, they were less likely to have the conversations than if they had good, a good relationship and better communication. And then overall, how comfortable did they feel? And those that felt more comfortable were more likely to engage in those conversations. And that bolsters the sense that if we can give them more ideas and guidance about how to have these conversations, it could increase their, com their comfort and thereby increase their engagement in the behavior. So we've talked a lot about parents. We actually asked a similar set of questions for supervisors. 
we obviously shifted the context. It wasn't in the family context, it was in workplace. And so the language had to change. But, but there's still somewhat of a similar relationship in that a supervisor is expected to have these sort of conversations with the people that uh, report to them. And um, they're expected to teach and support and potentially motivate them. So we wanted, we used a, a, a separate survey and a separate sample. This wasn't the same people responding. These are completely different people responding to this other survey. So what we found with supervisors in the workplace was very interesting. Now, we split this out into two groups and we, we filled the survey with a quota so that we had about 50% of the respondents requiring a commercial driver's license or a CDL and 50% not requiring a CDL or commercial driver's license. Now, a commercial driver's license is required for anybody driving a commercial vehicle over a certain weight. So that uh, large mass increases the potential risk of that vehicle in a crash. So they need to have a better, uh, 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 more training and a higher level of licensing. Also, if they're dry, uh, transporting hazardous materials or if they're driving a vehicle with a number of passengers, like a, a small bus driver or a bus driver. All of those could require a commercial driver license or CDL. You can see the responses to their, these questions are very different between those with a CDL and those without a CDL. In particular, those with a CDL are engaging in a lot more risky driving behaviors, in particular uh, distracting behaviors, than those without a CDL we kind of might expect it to be the opposite. So this is very concerning. And we've seen this pattern on other surveys that we've done where we've split out CDL versus non-CDL. So when we think about commercial uh, drivers who, who drive for work, we can't treat them all the same. And it does appear we have quite a bit of work to do with those with a CDL who are potentially uh, engaging in a lot of distracting behaviors. We asked about workplace rules. Now, this was interesting because in general, those with a CDL reported having more workplace rules than those without a CDL, even though the people with the CDL were engaging in a lot more distracting behaviors. So this really raises some important questions about rules. Is a rule sufficient? A rule may be necessary, but it may not be sufficient. Here, here we see people who don't have a rule are engaging in less distracted driving behaviors. So while we need the rule, we really need to have conversations about the rule because the CDL folks are reporting that they have the rule, but they're still engaging in the risky behaviors. And I think this is so important that it can't just be about just passing a policy and call it good. You've got to have that policy talked about. You have to make sure everybody understands it. You need to clarify that, yes, this policy is real in our work group. And as a supervisor, I'm going to expect you to follow the policy, and I'm going to follow up if you don't. So um, I think it really lends support for this notion that we can't just have policies and rules, but we really need to have policies and rules supported by active conversations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we ask those supervisors about similar supervising behaviors. Do they get input before they talked about this? And like parents with teenagers, supervisors reported getting input less than the other three behaviors that we asked about. So while some of them are doing it, there's a lot of room to grow. And you'll see the questions have a very parallel um, design as they did with parents. We asked them about teaching. Again, they reported more engagement in teaching than getting input. Um, they are doing some teaching. There's clearly room to grow. And of course, we're very concerned, even, even with the teaching, how, how good is that teaching when they're not modeling it, in particular amongst those CDL folks. So there, there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, room to grow here. Support, are they providing follow-up? Are they uh, 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 reminding folks when they violate policies? Are they following up with appropriate consequences? 
Yes, but there's clearly room to grow here as well. And are they recognizing individuals when they're making good choices? Um, yes, they're doing that. But uh, again, with the other ones, as we saw, there's definitely room to grow. All right, so what we did is we took all those results. Uh, we used the, you know, collected similar and, and, and analyzed similar behavioral models for the supervisors as we did for the parents. We looked at what beliefs were influencing behaviors. And then we developed two resources. We developed some guidance. We actually provided sort of written guidance about how a parent or a supervisor could engage in a conversation with a teenager or somebody that they supervised to walk through these four different steps, getting input, teaching, supporting, and motivation, recognizing. And we wove into those the perception of importance, the comfort in using, the willingness, and suggestions uh, for improvements. And then what we did is we also developed messages to promote this guidance. And we tested the guidance, I mean the message to promote the guidance, using uh, asking about their emotional reaction. We use nine word pairs to assess their emotional reaction, their perception of efficacy, whether and whether they thought it was credible and their intention to read the guidance. So if they just heard the promotional message, how likely were they to then follow up and read the guidance? So we assessed that as well as giving them the guidance and having them respond to some questions on that. Like the first survey, we went back and we recruited um, new participants and we recruited parents with young drivers as well as supervisors of employees who drive for work. Here's an example parent message. So as parents, we play an important role in keeping our teens safe. Often the key to our teen safety is finding ways to have conversations with them. Conversations about distracted and engaged driving are critical, especially if you have a young driver in your family. Distractions are anything that takes a driver's eyes off the road, hands off the wheel, or mind off driving, like using a cell phone, adjusting the radio, or even reaching for an object. Distracted driving significantly contributes to motor vehicle crashes, especially among young and inexperienced drivers. Instead of lecturing or giving advice, I chose to have, a com have conversations about engaged driving. We created rules together about engaged driving. The guidance on conversations to support engaged driving gave me the words to use so I could have constructive conversations with my team in ways that strengthened our relationship. To learn more about guidance on conversations to support engaged driving, visit what other website. So we created this just as a draft message. This could be used in a wide variety of ways by stakeholders, right? I mean, you could put this in an email, you could shorten it up or do something and record it as a PSA and put it on the radio. You could put it out on social media. You could have different people use it in different contexts. But it was all just to drive people to perhaps your website or another resource where you could include the guidance. And we created a similar document, similar script, but different language for a supervisor. And then we asked the survey participants sort of what, what their reaction to this message was. What we found is that um, most indicated they were moderately or more likely to read the guidance. So that was very good. Um, had they heard this message and were given an easy way to get the guidance, they were likely to, to follow it up. So that was great. They responded that with a very positive, affective reaction to the message. In other words, they felt it was positive. They thought it was interesting, appealing, pleasant, likable, uplifting. Those are the kinds of things we'd like to see from a message in terms of them taking a step afterwards. And they perceived it being effective. So that was good. It, it doesn't guarantee that it is, but these are things that increase the likelihood that such a message will work. They also perceived that it had a high degree of credibility. We also asked responses about the guidance. So then we gave them the guidance document sort of in chunks and had them respond to different parts. They agreed that it was important to engage in conversations with their team. 
and they were comfortable using the guidance, which is really what we wanted to see. We tried to lay it out and make it easy and have some tips so that it would be something that they would be comfortable using. And they reported that they were willing to use the guidance, which is important. So those were all positive reactions to the, to the uh, guidance and the message that we created to promote the guidance. We found similar responses for uh, supervisors. So I won't go through those, but it was a very similar reaction by supervisors. So what are some key takeaways from our project? One, we really think that families and workplaces are an important potential context to address distracted driving. There is no silver bullet in improving traffic safety or in uh, eliminating distracted driving, right? It's gonna take multiple strategies. And it's just interesting to think about what could we do in the family or workplace context to improve um, uh, efforts to reduce distracted driving. And I think what we're seeing is it's, it's absolutely gonna take rules and policies, but it's gonna take more than that. That's necessary, but not sufficient. Many and parents and supervisors themselves are engaging in distracted driving. So as I mentioned before, this, this mechanism of reaching a parent about distracted driving in the context of their child could also influence the parents' own beliefs and behaviors. So we don't wanna miss that, that sort of secondary effect because it's, it's needed. They're engaging in distracted driving as our supervisors. There are a variety of beliefs that are associated with willingness to engage in distracting behaviors. It's not just one. Their attitude, whether they think it's safe or dangerous, perceived norms, what do others expect of them, what do they think others are doing, and their perceived control, their own sense of whether they can choose to, to do it or not. These are all important in terms of influencing their behaviors. Many families have rules about distracted driving and there's clearly room to grow. Likewise, um, workplaces did too. There are opportunities to, but there are definitely opportunities to improve the conversations between parents and teens. Um, it's not just about a one-time conversation. It is about multiple conversations. Likewise, as I mentioned, many workplaces have rules about distracted driving and there's definitely room to grow. There are opportunities to improve those conversations between supervisors and employees. And in particular, we could need to explore, you know, sort of what's going on in this CDL context where those folks seem to be engaging. They have more rules, but they're also engaging in more risky behaviors. We also learned about reactions to the resources that we created. Both parents and supervisors responded favorably to the messages promoting the conversation guidance. So that's a good sign. We feel like these messages could be useful to potentially promote them. Both responded favorably to the guidance itself. So they reviewed the guidance and, and had positive comments about them. Um, and go back for a second. We, we also asked questions to sort of any suggestions they had a few suggestions, so we, we uh, sought to uh, take their suggestions and in, in include that as well. So there are uh, several documents that are available for you as follow-up if you want to learn more. The actual conversation guidance documents are available as PDF files, so you can download those and readily share them. They're laid out in sort of a, a somewhat nice graphical format. They're designed for parents or those in a parenting role, as well as supervisors. There's also resources to promote the guidance. So that resources have the messages that I mentioned, but it also just has more ideas about how you might promote each of those uh, guidance documents. So that's available that you can download. There's also a large summary poster that summarizes the entire project. It's something that you would print out on a sort of large format printer that you could display, but it is available. And if you're interested, the whole final report, which goes through the entire project in much more detail, has all the surveys, all the survey results. So if you really want to get into it, um, you can get those. And these are all available on the MDT Traffic Safety Culture website, which is on the MDT site. And you can get to that site either by following the URL listed here, or you can just Google MDT Traffic Safety Culture. That's the easiest way to find it. If you Google that, this, this site will pop up first. 
So you can just Google MDT traffic safety culture. You'll go right to the, the overall projects page. This lists all the projects. And then you wanna select the engaged driving project. Um, and then all these tools and resources will be listed there. I do want to acknowledge the limitations. This was not an experimental design. Um, we did not seek to manipulate anybody's beliefs and then measure changes in their behaviors. It was all done with correlation. And correlation does not establish causality. Um, correlation is a good indicator of what uh, is associated, what beliefs are associated with behaviors, but we can't establish um, causality from just a correlation analysis. Therefore, the, the recommendations may result in behavior change, but we don't have specific evidence of actual behavior change. It's actually a project we'd like to do to actually go out and gather some evidence around this. We also wanna acknowledge this project began prior to the COVID-19 lockdowns, and then right in the middle of the project is when COVID really took off. Um, we had to briefly pause the project, and then we resumed in the spring of 2021. So, you know, things were different in the spring of 2021. People were starting to drive a little bit, you know, getting back to driving. But we have to acknowledge that that this was an odd time, obviously, going through a pandemic. So, so the world was a little bit different. We don't know what impact that might have had in terms of distracting behaviors, but... Um, we just have to acknowledge that that was the context and it was certainly a difference between when we started and when we finished. All right, so I wanna pause here and ask if there are any questions. You can put those in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, so one question that has come up is what was the cost of the project? So we checked in with Sue Sillick and she reported that the cost of the project was about 152,000. So it was done I think over about 18 months or more, I think we had to extend it a little bit because of the pandemic, but it was about 152,000. Uh, any other questions? Um, so another question, do the safety behaviors differ among groups and regions? So that's a great question. We asked, uh, we, we recruited respondents from across the United States and really we had a huge number of states participate. However, we did not have enough samples in any individual state to draw conclusions or compare respondents in one state versus another. Just, there just weren't that many. Um, nor, um, now the one group, the, the one um, groups that we did divide, we did look at um, the CDL versus the non-CDL. And we actually used quotas so that we made sure we had a large number of, of those two groups. It was 50-50 roughly in terms of the number of respondents. And um, there we were, as, as you saw, able to see some very significant differences. We also had people self-identify on their survey about their geography, sort of where they lived, whether it was an urban environment, suburban, or rural. And we used the, the designation for population levels that the census uses. And um, we really didn't see a lot of differences there either. We looked at those three groups and don't, don't really see large differences in behaviors or beliefs amongst those three different groups. Um, we, the survey was uh, people of variety of ethnicities and racial backgrounds did participate in the survey. However, it was predominantly completed by individuals who uh, self-identified as white. Um, and so we don't have the ability to sort of um, look at differences by race or, or uh, Hispanic, non-Hispanic ethnicity. Um, so really, we don't have a lot of information about the subpopulations except for that CDL versus non-CDL. So I'll check, see if there are any other questions. Okay, not seeing any. Um, if you want to be aware of some related research, that the, the transportation um, traffic safety culture pooled fund is engaged in. They're also in a project right now that is looking at a review of methods to change beliefs. And um, that project will ultimately result in some guidance for practitioners, uh, as well as a project to look at ways to um, reduce multi-risk driving behaviors. Um, if you're familiar with traffic safety, you know that we often look at traffic safety behavior somewhat in isolation. So we sort of think about seatbelts, or we think about impaired, or we think about speeding. 
But actually, when um, you look at some of the data, you'll find that they're individuals who engage in multiple risky behaviors. So they might not be wearing their seatbelt and they're speeding. Sometimes they might be impaired, they might be aggressive. So these can overlap. And we wanted to sort of look at is there an approach that we might use with somebody who engages in multi-risk driving that might be different than we'd engage with somebody who just isn't wearing their seatbelt? Um, and so that's a, a bit of a longer project. So we're actually gonna be able to do some experimental work there, but keep your eye out for those. You can also check on the Traffic Safety Culture Pooled Fund website, which is you know, on MDT's site, um, about other projects we've done in the past. So you can follow these projects as they unfold, but you can also look at past projects, which include some work we've done at trying to understand driving under the influence of cannabis, as well as um, we developed a traffic safety culture primer and some other tools, some slides and things like that, a short video that can help um, just increase people's knowledge about traffic safety culture, as well as a primer and some other tools on proactive traffic safety. So I'd encourage you to check out that site, look at some of the previous projects and keep an eye out for future projects. I mentioned and see what we can learn. Um, what was the cost of the project? So the details of the cost, I will, I will put back um, through the pooled fund with Sue. Um, she would have more of that costing information than I would. Um, I, I, we could find it out. I don't have it off the top of my head, but we could definitely look back at it. It was uh, originally, I mean, it, it got delayed a little bit because of the pandemic. So it was originally set up, I think, as an 18 month project, but it got extended a little bit longer because of the delays in the pandemic. But I, it's a good question. I don't have the details of the cost. So the cost is uh, about $152,000. Oh, great. So Sue's right there with real time information. So it's about 152000 Any other questions or thoughts? We've got a few minutes. I will also put up for the recording and you all can read just the standard disclaimers. Do the safety behaviors differ? Oh, among groups and regions. So um, the size of the sampling did not allow us to look at subpopulations. We did look at, you know, you saw the one group that we did, we did split out, which was CDL and non-CDL. Um, we did a little bit of looking at also, um, we had people self-report their, 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 we knew what state they were coming from, but the numbers by state are way too low to, for us to draw any sort of conclusions from. But we did have them report sort of, do you live in an urban, suburban, or rural area? And we gave them population descriptions that follow the census designation. And we looked at some of their um, behaviors regarding their geography and, and not, not as strong as we did not see a strong association coming up with either their parenting behaviors, their supervising behaviors, or their distracted driving behaviors based on that kind of geography. Um, so we don't, and, and we didn't have sort of any other, um, we didn't have large enough numbers in terms of um, any racial or ethnicity groups to look at any kind of breakdowns. Um, the only really one we were focusing in on was um, the CDL and the non-CDL because we really, um, we designed, we, we, wanted, we screened in, so we got a good 50% uh, um, of the participants having a CDL and 50% without a CDL so we could make that comparison because we had seen that pattern come up. But it's a really good question to ask, um, but we just don't have enough uh, samples to sort of break down into, into smaller groups. Any other questions or comments? Well, um, I really appreciate your time today. We certainly appreciate all the work that you do in your context to improve traffic safety. Um, we encourage you to uh, keep an eye out on the different projects that the pooled fund is doing um, to, so you can continue to learn and, and uh, share some of the products that are created. There are other projects listed on that MDT site, previous projects to this, and you might wanna look at those as well. Some um, projects around understanding driving under the influence of cannabis as well as some primers on traffic safety culture, as well as proactive traffic safety. So I'd encourage you to look at uh, the other projects as well. 
Well, um, it's a Friday. I hope you all have a wonderful uh, and, and healthy uh, and safe Friday and weekend. Wear your seatbelt, don't drive distracted, and we'll be in touch soon. Take care.